My name's Ethan. I'm currently a rising third year at Girton College in engineering. I'm from the U.S., so just a little bit of background. So mainly I was applying to U.S. schools, um, Carnegie Mellon, BT Austin, uh, a bunch of like Cornell, um, a bunch of pretty, uh, pretty good engineering schools. And then I just applied to Cambridge on a whim because I figured, you know, I might as well shoot my shot. And my sister had done the uh, process two years ago, so I was kind of a little bit into that kind of system. And then I did a couple of practice tests and kind of just uh, went in and just won it. I just saw, wanted to see if I could do well in it. Um, and I ended up doing fairly well, I think. I never got my results back. And um, I got invited for an interview, which went very well with, uh, with my current, well, the current deputy head of the department, which is, mm. which is, a lot of stress, <laughs> but but um, that went well, and ultimately I landed here. And um, I figured, you know, it's Cambridge. I'll get some a new experience. So uh, let me just go there and see what happens. It's a very different idea than if you've ever applied to U.S. schools. It's very different because in U.S. schools, you're trying to create a personal narrative of why you are the way you are and why you're trying to study the things you are. Um, but in the UK and in UCAS, it's much more like factual and informational and what have you done so far that have made you qualified to study what you need to study. And, um, and while you can kind of weave a little bit of that personal narrative, um, I highly recommend kind of just list, figuring out, well, first of all, figuring out exactly what you, what makes you want to study what you want to study. So for me, it was um, engineering, but more specifically uh, information engineering, because I'd done a lot of software back in high school and middle school. Um, and then also kind of creating it, listing out what have you done relating to that, making that into like some sort of chronological story, um, which really helps with making the flow of your personal statement uh, a lot better. I got into robotics because my mom had signed me up for a robotics camp because I was playing too many video games. So I had gone to that robotics camp and I had done pretty well in it because I had done very li like a little bit of programming before, but and I had gotten like a tiny bit of the basics, but not a lot. But I kind of was able to use that to jump really quickly in this robotics camp and I got a lot of experience really quickly. Um, and I figured, hey, look, like this kind of programming thing is really cool, especially robotics, because in programming, you can kind of think of things as very abstract. But when you turn into robotics, you have a physical robot that you've also built and consider the mechanical structural properties of that. And you've also combined that with a little bit of electrical engineering. And now your programming is has a physical manifestation um, in robotics. Yeah, shameless plug. The place is storming robots in, um, in Branchburg, New Jersey. I have nothing but high praise to say of the people who work there and um, people who have taught me there. Um, but then I got into robotics through that and then I went to high school and I did high school robotics as well um, I met like a group of people that I really liked really like working with um, So I got further into that engineering and I figured, you know, why not? Um, kind of apply that in a more broader sense and let's go study engineering And this might be cliche, but I think you should just get started doing it like it's You can't really like read about everything like, I think that this is the same about programming as well. It's that like you can't really read about all the theory and then try and program. I think you should just try and program it. If something fails, you can fix it. And over time, you will learn how the, what is the right way of doing things, how to do things. And ultimately, that will um, provide you with the experience you need to be a better roboticist programmer. I would say Lego's Mindstorms is always a good bet, especially if you're just getting started, because you can go from like the drag and drop, um, like codeless solution towards something that's a little bit more like code heavy, like um like robot c that can kind of push you toward some more advanced concepts but what i would and also i highly recommend going to places that would teach you because they not only have the lego mind service kits already you don't need to buy any of it but also they have people who can help you um again swimming robots was the place for me um i recommend anybody who can go there um to go there of uh, i one thing i would rec i would not recommend is kind of throwing yourself into the deep end with like Raspberry Pis and Arduinos because although like they're at the very basic level they're they're relatively simple once you start to try and do a little bit more complicated projects and if you're not experienced you can it's quite difficult to conceptualize. Mm -hmm. So you don't think like say free YouTube videos are I think, enough to guide them? 
I think free YouTube videos are great. Um, and I think that, especially in the software engineering space, um, you can learn a lot by going online. But it's always helpful to know, especially in robotics, um, if you can find, if there's somebody that you can rely on to, to answer your questions. Mm -hmm. Because there are going to be situations that you run into where maybe programming wise or mechanically or electrically, like there is something wrong with your robot. And unless you even have a semblance and the experience to know where to start looking, it is hard to get started. So having somebody to rely on who's experienced, who knows what they're doing, um, is always a really good bet. But if you don't have the ability to go to somewhere um, that can like have that facility and have those people teach you, um, then yeah, free YouTube videos, Stack Overflow, uh, pretty much online, any online resource will really help. There's, the, the world is, uh, the like, the internet is very um, vast. That's the way to... And for the ENGAA, um, I would say just do some practice tests. You, you know your physics well and make sure that uh, that you're really quick because I think most people on the ENGA suffer from moving through the questions too slowly. So um, definitely make sure that you, when you do those practice tests, you're doing those questions very quickly so that you can make sure you get to at least see all the questions and at least have a chance at them. On the ENGA, there are going to be questions for that on topics that you have never, never studied or maybe you have tangentially studied but not studied in depth. So. Um, you have to be able to kind of make educated guesses and infer like how to solve that problem based off of what you know. Be calm. Uh, I think this goes for any interview for that matter. Um, I think if you get yourself too anxious and you start to overthink things, then you're going to start to get things wrong. If you stay calm and make sure that you're thinking straight, I think that uh, really, really helps. So just take deep breaths drink some water. I don't know. I don't know what helps people make calm, make themselves calm. But for me, it's just kind of taking a little bit of a moment to myself before the interview and just kind of calming myself down before I go into it. Um, in terms of the actual Cambridge interview itself, the, the entire experience is a learning experience. They may not necessarily expect you to get the question right. They expect you to get the thinking process right, which is why it's so important that you emphasize what you're thinking of and how like how you came to that conclusion mm -hmm. because maybe your answer isn't right but they got to see your whole thinking yeah. process and that's what really matters they don't really care if you ended up getting the number because you could have just thrown into a calculator and gotten the number um but what they wanted to see is like oh what formulas are you applying how did you come to that formula what assumptions are you making based on that formula that you're using uh and if you kind of delineate that whole process uh, then they have a much better idea of who you are as a person what kind of engineer are you and whether or not of course to end up uh, accepting you to their college why did you apply to Girton? like did you know it was going to be so far away i, I okay first well to answer that in two parts i did not know it was gonna be so far away um but i also didn't apply i did an open application so, okay wow yeah i kind of didn't know what the whole college system was so i just applied wherever um and while I don't necessarily enjoy the bike ride every time I have to go to the engineering department, I definitely like Girton as a whole. Um, I live in very nice dorms. Um, Girton as a whole is a very nice college, probably one of the nicest colleges out there, in fact. Mm, I agree. But it's Very maybe, nice people. Yeah, nice people as well. And if only we're a little bit closer. But other than that, I, you know, honestly, I really enjoy it. <laughs> Are you hoping next year to be at, like online so that you don't have to cycle to the department? Mm. I, I wouldn't mind it if we had lectures online, but I I would like to see people again. <laughs> you Aww. Know? Yeah, like it's... And also, like online lectures and online supervisions kind of don't hold you accountable. So like your, your teaching experience kind of goes yeah, it's not, it's not great. It's not great. So it's like the sacrifice of having to bike there versus online lectures. And honestly, I'd rather just go in person lectures, especially next year if I'm doing like info. Well, my supervisors have all been great. Um, there are bar, there are like some supervisions that I'm just like, 
why am I really here? <laughs> and some of the some of the supervisors, like some some of them are quite at least my supervisors are quite senior, so they may not always have enough time. Um, but uh, but for the most part, everybody, all the supervisors, are super nice. If you reach out, they will reach back to help you. Um, so no, I don't really have any abysmal supervision stories. Maybe it's just, if it like only did like half a half an example paper, then it's like you know I'll wing the rest. <laughs> <laughs> what about abysmal supervision partners? Oh wait, well so hmm. <laughs> uh, no, I don't think I had any abysmal supervision partners. For the most part, I mean Jeremy is now my supervision partner, so well, that's <laughs> so that's a pretty abysmal, right? <laughs> no, he's great. He's great. Um, at least his supervision partner, he's uh, we get to do work together, and um, at least he holds me accountable to what I need to do. So I've enjoyed it so far. Thing like you wish you'd known about Cambridge two years ago when you first came. How far great it is. <laughs> um, uh, how small the town is really as a as a like as a whole. Cambridge is not a large, but like, people say it's a city, but like it's a city. Is, is it though? It's like the fact that you can walk across the entire city relatively quickly, and this really like it's a it's a quaint place to live. Like if you want a really a a really big city, like obviously London and even Oxford is a better better city per se, but. Um, and I might get, I don't know, I don't know, I might get flagged for that, but, <laughs> <laughs> but Cambridge is a really nice place to live. Um, the architecture, the scenery, the green spaces, it's, it's great to be able to live there. There's a lot of, um, nature to, to be around and that kind of helps. It helps a lot, especially when you're in uni, stressful uni times. Um, but other than that, I would say just try and get to know as many people as possible. Um, people, the, the, some of the brightest minds are there, obviously, so, you know, um, you'll have some pretty amazing conversations. 